Thank you so much for having me. My name is Jeremy Walker. I'm one of the infectious disease fellows, a former UAB medical student. So I definitely um, feel being in your shoes. And that transition to between second and third year is hard regardless. And I think particularly for you being out um, of the clinical world for a little while and having to come back in from research, I can uh, imagine is, is fairly challenging. And so the whole point of this is to kind of think through how the way that we approach cases, the way that we think about medicine changes as we go from uh, being a medical student in the first two years to being in the clinical world of the third and fourth year. So I want to give credit as we get started to Dr. Centaur and Dr. Kramer, who both kind of helped me a lot as I was um, going into that, uh, going between second, third year, and then even into internship and residency about how to think through um, patients as a clinician. Uh, so our objectives for today is just to discuss some basic components of clinical reasoning, including problem representation and illness scripts. And then we're going to specifically go into some common illness scripts for chest pain, just because I think it's an important concept to recognize and identify some tools that will inform our clinical practice. So to begin, I think it's always best to begin with a case, right? And so this is actually a case that was uh, shared to me by a fellow MS3. Um, and the case is a story of a 35-year-old lady with a history of anaphylaxis who presented with swelling. Um, and the uh, kind of history that was given to him from the resident was that she had a recent bee sting and she had a known allergy to bees and then she also described some shortness of breath and throat swelling and then he had the vitals there in front of him because it's right there on the screen and so she was hypertensive and she was breathing quickly and also had a fast heart rate. And so the intern, you know, appropriately sent him in to see the patient so he could learn a little bit more about a classic condition, anaphylaxis. Um, and so the first thing to kind of bring up as we're thinking about patients is something called a problem representation. So that's a one to three sentence summary kind of defining a case in abstract terms. And the abstract terms is actually a key component of this because you don't want to get bogged down in the details. You want to just kind of hinge upon the critical pieces of the story so that you can use those points to really define your differential. Um, and as you're in the room talking to patients, this is continuously updating. And so you may see that um, that what you started off thinking is one problem as you learn more and more pieces of history you recognize that it's not really the chest pain that brought them in it was the passing out or the shortness of breath and that can kind of help to define how you approach the patient um, so for this case it would be if i were to give it a problem representation i would describe it as a young female notice young instead of going to a specific age, who presents with a history of anaphylaxis and has acute swelling and shortness of breath following a bee sting. And then her initial evaluation is notable for the vital sign abnormalities that we talked about. So the next thing that you're doing as you're trying to form this um, problem representation for this patient is you're mentally going through illness scripts. And so you may find yourself in the room with the intern or resident and you wonder why they all of a sudden jump to the series of questions that they did. And the reason is they essentially jump to a new illness script that they're trying out on the patient and the patient's story. So the illness script, I like to think of it as essentially a note card. Um, which is basically like the note card where you keep all the information for that specific diagnosis. So for example here we can point out heart failure. And so this is everything that you've learned about heart failure from reading in textbooks. For you it's this the things that you kind of remember from uh, the first couple years of medical school. But as you see more cases you start to fill up that card a little bit more and you may even, those cases can be things that you've seen individually, but also things that you've seen presented or that you've read about. And so what's fun is it starts out with your note card being pretty small. You have your few uh, key clinical features and then as you go through training all of a sudden that um, note card really fills up and you gain a lot more insight and then sometimes it fills up so much that you have to have a second note card you know you have heart failure with reduced EF you have heart failure preserved EF maybe you have heart failure associated with certain types of drugs and the list can go on and on depending on what your area of interest is so with that being said what is your illness script for anaphylaxis and I 
I kind of challenge you, I think one of the important things when you're learning something is that you have to bring stuff back to the forefront of your memory to attach things to it. So normally, if we were discussing in person, I would kind of challenge you to, to kind of give me some feedback. So if you want to, as we're going through this, just pause the video for a second and kind of develop your own illness script before we move forward, um, it might be a good way to, to interact with this. But I'll tell you some things that I would think of if I think of anaphylaxis. Usually it's pretty rapid and onset. It can be within the first 24 hours, but usually it's within the first minute to few hours. Um, usually they have some hives or some sort of rash, tongue swelling, of course the wheezing or strider that we think of. Often you think of patients with previous allergies or a known allergy as we saw in our patient. Usually their blood pressure is actually really low rather than high and they often have abdominal pain or nausea. So let's go back to Mrs. H. Remember we said she was a young female with history of anaphylaxis who comes in with acute shortness of breath and uh, swelling after a bee sting and we talked about her initial evaluation. So you start asking her questions, you're trying out your illness script and you realize that the bee sting was actually greater than 48 hours ago. And rather than swelling more over her lips or in places that you would think about, it was actually most pronounced in her lower extremities. She had a headache, which was really her most prominent symptom and what really brought her in, which wasn't something that was initially even in your problem representation, but you quickly realized was her biggest area of concern. Her speech was normal, there was no strider or wheezing, and she had no rash or other signs. Um, and so if you kind of highlight those features, you realize that some of the big components of what you learned from her were not in your initial problem representation and may not fit great with your illness script. So as a third year medical student, what they did, not knowing what else to do, they just moved to the physical exam because that's what you do next, right? And so as they moved into the physical exam, they actually realized she had a very distended abdomen with uh, markings consistent with pregnancy. And they kind of had this moment of looking and all of a sudden realized the patient was like, oh yeah, I'm actually in my 37th week gestation. You might think it's amazing that a patient wouldn't have already brought that up at, to this point in the um, interview, but actually that sometimes does happen. Unfortunately, we, we have a population that doesn't always have a great health literacy and may not recognize those important details. So now, um, all of a sudden you have, and then you start asking, of course, your illness script now flips and you're asking about prior pregnancies and they recognize that the first child was actually, the patient had one prior child who was induced at 38 weeks due to severe blood pressure problems. So now our problem representation has completely changed, right? We have a G2P1 female with history of preeclampsia who presents with progressive anasarca, which just means diffuse body swelling, um, shortness of breath, headache, and severely elevated blood pressure at 37th week gestation. Very different clinical picture, very different management, very concerning. And so I, I bring that up to say, not, not to like point towards any one that was involved in the care, we can all make mistakes and we can all be biased. The patient in this case was biased. History of bee sting came in saying, hey, I have an allergy to bees, I'm swelling, and kind of labeled everyone to think that's what's going on, which I think is the most dangerous thing is you're, especially early in your training, you kind of get um, often sent with a problem already diagnosed. You're told this is what's going on, here's your two-liner, and you walk in the room. And I think what can be, what is amazing about this case is because the student had more time than the other members of the team to really sit in and start to get more history, they recognized when things didn't really quite fit and ended up finding out that the patient really needed to be sent over to the labor and delivery quite rapidly because this was a medical emergency um, and so the patient was benefited. So as a medical student you can be the difference and treat every patient as your own. Um, with that, I want to just kind of jump into a problem of chest pain, which is something that you're going to see quite often in clinical practice, and we'll walk through kind of how you would evaluate someone that you got sent to and your intern tells you, hey, this is someone with chest pain in the ED, um, why don't you go and evaluate them? So. We'll start, this, this is all gonna be about Mr. B, 55 year old male, history of diabetes, uh, smokes tobacco, high blood pressure, and he comes in with severe chest pain of 16 hours. So that's your kind of one liner. It did wake him from sleep, and he's never had pain like this before. You see his blood uh, pressure there, and or his vital signs in general. So what illness scripts would you consider? What would be a way to think through his clinical presentation? Some people might point you to thinking through 
the most concerning features first. He's arrived in the ED, so what do we need to rule out? Essentially, what can kill you that presents as chest pain? And so there's a helpful mnemonic called the seven deadly causes of chest pain. So if you want, you can try to jot it down and see if you can get them all. Um, but what you'll see is that, you know, these are the things that, um, you know, come up quite frequently and as we're learning and there's a lot of different rules and tools we can use to evaluate these different diagnoses. So we're going to walk through at least a top group together today and make sure we don't, we're not missing any of these in our patient. So first, aortic dissection, and as I um, move to the next slide, you'll actually see my initial problem representation for our patients. So if you want to try to take a second to make a problem representation, you can. Um, oh, actually, I'm sorry. That is our initial problem representation. We'll go back to our illness script for aortic dissection. Um, so illness script. Oftentimes, I think of uh, patients that have a predisposing condition, so the most commonly tested I feel like is syphilis, um, but honestly, the most common in practice is uh, just coronary artery, or, you know, atherosclerosis. Um, uh, there it is also sometimes you'll, you'll notice uh, a history of trauma being a significant thing, especially um, on the boards. It tends to be older individuals, which fits with that um, picture of atherosclerosis. They always describe tearing, um, a tearing pain that radiates to the back. And you, you can sometimes see that the blood pressure is different in the left arm compared to the right. Um, one of the things that's really concerning is if the patient has passed out because that indicates a decreased blood flow to the brain. Um, and if the tear actually goes back and involves um, the coronary arteries or even goes back into the pericardial sac, that can cause um, it's, it can be critically, um, it leads to critical illness within just a few minutes. So it's something that you want to catch very early. The um, classic image that you'll see posted on your uh, boards is the widened mediastinum on chest x-ray. Um, so with that illness script, let's uh, go to our problem representation. So, a 55-year-old male comes in with diabetes, tobacco abuse, high blood pressure, who presents with severe chest pain that woke him from sleep. We know is vital. So think about some of the questions that you might ask. Um, so as you get more history, you realize it did not um, have any syncope. The pain was sharp, more than tearing, but does radiate to the left shoulder. He's got no morphinoid features, so that could be a common um, sign, especially in someone that's younger because something like Ehlers-Danlos or some other predisposing factor. Um, and blood pressure was symmetric. So at this point, would you evaluate further? Would you order any additional tests? Um, you potentially, one of the things you might look at is a wide mediastinum, just because you, most anyone that comes in with chest pain is going to need a chest x-ray. So you think, well, I'll look and see what the, I know it was done, let me see what the chest x-ray shows me, and let's see if this patient actually has a wide mediastinum. So of course you can look at the radiology read, but where might you go to learn more about radiology findings, etc. So a couple of helpful resources is Radiopedia. Um, it's a great uh, online resource that has, walks through a lot of different imaging findings and differentials for them. And so you'll notice here um, this image from Wadiopedia shows this nice wide mediastinum um, that is a classic case of uh, aortic dissection. Um, you can also go to UpToDate. UpToDate is a very helpful resource to kind of give you some um, just high yield clinical facts that you would need to know in the moment while you're evaluating this patient. Um, but you're reassured the patient has no widened mediastinum and so you feel comfortable kind of excluding that diagnosis for now. You didn't have a lot of hits on your illness script. So let's go to the next one, myocardial infarction. What is your illness script for myocardial infarction, coronary artery disease? Some things that you probably think of as the elephant on the chest, right? The crushing chest pain, radiating to the jaw or shoulder. Tends to, I mean, we think about males having earlier onset. Certainly ours would fit in that range. Do they? Ha you want to know about history? Have they ever had this before? Have they had stable chest pain and now all of a sudden it's, it's worse? We always ask about relief, what relieves the pain. I feel like that's a classic thing as we're going through old carts and um, being relieved by nitrates or opiates is, is always a part of this history, um, at least the history that we try to gather, although it's not always um, what the patient will tell you. And then of course there's risk factors that our patient has many of, um, and then you'll look at EKG findings or other lab values to help confirm your diagnosis. So again, 
here's our patient, Mr. B, and we ask him some of those. We try out some of those things, and what we realize is he does have some decreased exercise tolerance that it sounds like is shortness of breath, but maybe there's some pain component to it. The pain is, again, sharp and radiates to the shoulder. Um, it's not relieved by nitro, and it's the EKG findings are really nonspecific. And unfortunately, unlike I think that's one of the big things when you move from the first and second year to the third year is, you know, for step one, when they give you a case presentation, I mean, even on step two, when they give you a case presentation, it's really clear. There is a right answer, um, and there is a most likely answer, and that is the one that you choose. However, in clinical reality, patients don't always present with the classic um, presentation, and you don't, you can't always just rely on what is the most likely diagnosis. You also have to exclude some of the maybe less likely diagnosis, but diagnosis that could be missed and could kill you. And so this, certainly myocardial infarction would fit into that category. So what would be some other things that you might um, do? You have conflicting info here, it doesn't fit the illness script purpose perfectly, so how would you prioritize what pieces are important? How would you choose what's, what test to order next? So one of the great things about things that are common and that we see like chest pain is that we have some great clinical prediction rules. So what are those? Those are mathematical tools that help guide us in uh, decision making. And so what they do is they basically do, they, they look at observational data and they create some predictors. They say what predicts certain outcomes in this population of people. And then they take those um, what they've kind of found as uh, predictors and they try to validate it in a new population. So they go to a new data set and see does this still work? Do we, are we still able to predict the people who are gonna have a myocardial infarction? And then once you can kind of predict, you need to know is that even impactful? Is our prediction helpful? Can we, can we improve outcomes or improve resource utilization based off applying this tool? So that kind of helps, it's part of the impact analysis. And if we can do that, then you know if we have data to support that, then it moves into widespread use. And so there's some great clinical prediction rules for chest pain and especially ruling out an ACS event or myocardial infarction and so the heart score is one I would point you to. Um, MD Calc by the way is a great um, app that has a lot of these resources in it. You can also find them through UpToDate and other things. But if you did a heart score for him um, you would find that this patient actually hits four points. Um, so he is a moderate score, moderate risk. So you can't just leave it there. You can't just assume it's not a heart attack at this point in time. You need to get some additional information. Um, I, just as an aside, other things that, you know, especially if you're on internal medicine, your attendings is just going to love, is if you look, there's a series called the Rational Clinical Exam. It has a few different um, pieces. One of the most helpful ones is this one that I highlighted, which is, does this patient with chest pain have acute coronary syndrome? And what's fun with this um, uh, entity is that it kind of gives you uh, basically how helpful are your physical exam findings, how helpful are your um, pieces of history, or are these scores in predicting whether or not a patient really has ACS. So what kind of uh, confidence interval do you have, or what kind of positive of predictive value? So this, what you find is that the scores, of course, perform the best, because the scores were specifically devised with that in mind. Um, a lot of this comes from this book, Evidence-Based Physical Diagnosis. I wouldn't necessarily say you have to go out and buy it, but it's a helpful resource at times to rent out from Lister Hill. So with that, you, um, your heart score, as we said, suggests an ACS rule out. Um, your troponin is positive, but not significantly so. Um, and so I think it, this, is, this is helpful, and you're certainly going to follow this pathway, but why don't we look for a more consistent cause, right? Because this isn't perfect. So what about pulmonary embolism? What is your illness script for PE? Um, PE is scary because it can present as any number of things. Um, it can be, you can have, uh, we, the classic description is sharp pleuritic pain. You think about hemoptysis. You think about having a proceeding blood clot in your lower extremities and potentially reasons for that. Um, typically patients are short of breath or at least breathing quickly. Um, there is this, uh, idea of uh, the EKG finding S1, Q3, T3. Um, it's like classically asked on boards and a uh, classic pimp question actually when you're on rounds, although it's actually pretty rare. Um, what is the most common EKG finding? It's uh, 
an increased heart rate, <laughs> which makes a lot of sense, right? Um, people tend to be tachycardic if they have a pulmonary embolism. Um, and the thing that's worried, so there was a recent trial in the last couple of years, and so this is fresh on everyone's mind, when they just looked at everyone who presented, I think it was in the Netherlands, everyone that presented with syncope, and they did a CTA on all of them, and there was actually a, a good, portion, like 10% or so, that presented um, with syncope that ended up having a PE. Some of those had none of the other features, and so it just represents a certain population that sometimes um, we hadn't thought about as much before, so it's fresh on people's minds, so you'll probably hear that when you're on wards. The other kind of new piece of data was um, if they did CTAs in people who had COPD exacerbations just weren't getting better, there was a significant portion that ended up having PEs. Um, so back to our patient, we want to pull out that card, think about the PE on the script, how does that fit? Well, the pain is sharp, um, but not really completely pleuritic, not worsen with deep breaths. He did have some recent exposure history, drove back from Orlando, so pretty long car ride. It was about 12 hours or so. Um, no signs or symptoms of DVT, though, and no family history of blood clots. We also know from prior that he, hadn't, he didn't have any syncope when we asked about the aortic dissection. Um, so do you feel comfortable in ruling out PE at this point in time? And this is the tough challenge, and this is where I think I just did not get this as a third year student. Um, because you would hear this story and you would think, this is not a PE. If I was on a board exam, I would never choose PE here, right? It just doesn't seem to fit. But yet you see people test for it anyway, and you ask why. And I think it gets to the point, well, how what is your threshold for testing versus your thre threshold for treatment? And I think for any diagnosis, that is an important thing to consider. Um, so if you think about it, for example, for um, if you were thinking about malignancy, if you were thinking about someone that has a cancer, what do you think your threshold to treat would be? would be really high, right? It would be somewhere near 100%. You're not gonna give someone chemotherapy unless you're confident they have a cancer and you know which one to give. Honestly, for PE, it's pretty close too because you're talking about anticoagulation, you're talking about anticoagulation for several months, um, so you don't want to do that flippantly. At the same time, what about testing threshold? How confident can you be to exclude PE before you wouldn't do anything further? You wouldn't need any further testing. It's a deadly disease, and it tends to be deadly in patients who are missed or who the diagnosis is missed. So low probability, I think most people would say, but what does that mean? Is that 20%? Is that 10%? Is that, is that 5%? Where would you draw the line? And so I think it's helpful to think about test thresholds. For some disease entities, our test threshold actually is way up here. Um, because our treatment threshold has come down a lot and they end up crisscrossing, right? I mean, if you see an, a rash in the outpatient setting, you might try a cream before you necessarily get it biopsied. If you have someone that comes in with, like a young person with reflux symptoms, no concerning features, you're just going to give them a medicine before you actually do any sort of testing, you would test down the road if that doesn't work. Um, but when you have something that has a treatment threshold that's high, your test threshold has to match the severity of the illness. And in this case with PE, it's a very severe illness. So this is just kind of highlighting um, the different thresholds where um, you would either not test at all, um, or you need to test but you're not ready to treat, or at some point you would just treat altogether, right? So again, for your purpose, where would you draw the line for this case? Um, it's, I think, a tough decision. Um, what they, what's nice is we have something called risk stratification tools. Again, tools that people have developed based off evidence to help us with this. And where they've kind of drawn the line you see is like less than 2%. So the perk to rule out PE allows you to basically say my chance is less than 2%. There's no need for further testing. Notice that one of the criteria, you have to get all of these as no to be perked out. And one of them is age. Um, less than 50 basically. So if someone is over the age of 50, they've already been, they, you can no longer use the PERC test because their risk has already gone up, which is true in our case. So then you go to the Wells criteria, um, which is another clinical risk stratification tool, but it gives you a little bit more um, nuance between unlikely versus likely. Because at some point, if you um, go back here, at some point, if, you, if we say that a, uh, we're sitting here, 
a D-dimer, getting, um, getting a D-dimer to try to help us may move us to here, but it's not going to take us all the way below 1 or 2%. It's not going to sufficiently rule it out to the point where we don't need further testing. So there's no point in doing further testing. I mean, there's no point in doing the D-dimer. We should go straight to a CTA in this point, which is, you know, to look at the actual arteries through imaging. However, if, our, if we're starting here with just maybe a 3 4% likelihood, we can do a D-dimer and it can safely put us in that pathway. So, Unlikely D-dimer, if we move into the likely category, we need to do a CTA. For our patient, we fall in that unlikely low risk group, and so we can do a D-dimer, which we actually already knew um, that it was negative because it was part of the initial screening labs they did. So we don't have to do any more. We may rule out PE. Moving down the list, um, just a couple more I want to highlight. First is pneumonia. Of course, I'm an infectious disease fellow, so we have to talk about pneumonia. Um, so what is your um, illness script for pneumonia? Um, what you'll see is that there is, uh, for me, there's actually a lot of cards I could pull out for pneumonia. We could talk about community-acquired pneumonia. We could talk about hospital-acquired pneumonia. We could talk about pneumonia from certain diseases, like pneumonia from Legionella, and how that compares to pneumonia from Mycobacterium versus a pneumonia from a fungal species. So as you get into your subspecialty, you may kind of move into a lot of different realms. But for your purposes, of course, you think about the common things, cough with purulent sputum, feverish chills, shortness of breath. You wanna look at an uh, infiltrate on chest X-ray, but ultimately this is a clinical diagnosis. And so there is no 100% confirmatory testing. You are just putting these features together. And remember, your, your chest X-ray is always gonna say correlate clinically. Um, so you'll put those pieces together and kind of come up with what you think, if you think the patient has pneumonia and then what, what type of bacteria are they at risk for. So in this case, go back to our patient, came in with kind of abrupt uh, chest pain, started over 16 hours, woke him from sleep. And we asked these questions. We pull out our, our card and think about pneumonia. And he has had some upper respiratory symptoms. He's kind of felt fatigued. He hasn't felt well, um, but no fevers. He's got a cough, but no sputum production. And his chest X-ray reads correlate clinically, which is what they always read. Um, and so, you know, you're debating clinically, do I think, they have the diagnosis, and ultimately, a lot of times what, what will end up happening early on while you're gathering data is it may end up getting treated, and then if they realize that there's a better explanation, they may stop. So that one dose of antibiotics, especially if you're narrowing the spectrum to community-acquired pneumonia, is not a bad thing, in, just in case that's what it ends up being, but you can get some more information. So what are you gonna do? Your, your intern has already told you, I think we're gonna to have to treat this guy for pneumonia at least now. So how are you gonna decide what to treat him with? How are you gonna pick antibiotics? So just a couple of helpful guides. Samford Guide is actually in the UAB hospital system now. Um, so you can download it. You can also uh, check it out from Lister Hill. It's, it's updated every year and it kind of runs you through any type of um, antibiotic choice that you would have. Uh, there's also the John Hopkins kind of uh, pharmaceutical guide, which will, has a, an antibiotic component, but other components as well. Um, you can go to guidelines. So guidelines are helpful in all different areas. There's a great guideline for community-acquired pneumonia. I should highlight that this is an older picture. There was actually brand new updates in uh, 2019. So. Um, really fresh piece of data to kind of go to and learn some of the empiric drugs they might use. And then your hospitals and a biogram. So if you have a better idea of what type of bacteria you're looking for, um, you can find the antibiogram for any hospital and it will, um, it will be a, a helpful resource to kind of decide which antibiotic you might choose. Um, so with that in mind, uh, the team decided to start antibiotics. They went with ceftriaxone and azithro, which is great for community-acquired pneumonia. But you know, the troponin is still unclear, and you hear the upper level say the word type 2 and STEMI, which you've never heard of before, um, which is an important time, especially when you're on medicine, and if you have some time, it's an admitting day, to ask, what does that mean? <laughs> Help me understand. And so type 2 and STEMI is basically when um, the heart is not getting enough um, blood flow, it's not getting enough oxygen, but it's not because of the fault of the vessels, or at least not completely the fault of the vessels. If the heart wasn't under so much stress, the vessels could get enough blood flow there. But because the heart is stressed, 
now all of a sudden the blood flow that's being delivered is not enough and they um, can have a type 2 insemi. So you can see that with infections, you can see that with a lot of different things that we've already discussed, PEs, etc. So the intern happens to be a budding cardiologist, already knew um, from you know, birth what they wanted to do, and they decided to examine the patient's um, heart using an ultrasound, which is really nice. We have some nice ultrasounds in the ED, and that's a helpful thing to learn how to do, actually. And what they see is there's actually this nice bit of fluid here surrounding the heart, and the, the RV is collapsing here in diastole. So this bit of fluid um, is concerning for an effusion, and the fact that the heart is collapsing in diastole would make you very concerned that that effusion is creating too much pressure, um, something that we call cardiac tamponade. So now you have a diagnosis. This patient has pericarditis, maybe secondary to a viral cause, um, which has been complicated by a tamponade. However, you realize, I don't have an illness script for tamponade. I honestly only heard it said a few times. So where would you go to read more? How are you gonna, how are you gonna work this out? Um, and so, of course, up to date and in the moment, up to date is something that we all go to quite frequently. A lot of, there's a lot of great review articles. I kind of like to just select these journals initially and see if I can find a good review article there. The AFP actually does some really, really helpful just clinical review articles if you're on wards and trying to get that perspective. Lancet tends to get um, a little deeper into some of the research, which is kind of fun, and then New England and JAMA um, kind of are somewhere in between on that spectrum. Um, so if you were to look up uh, in New England, you could find a great article on acute cardiac tamponade that you could read a little bit more about. Um, and then PubMed, and I think y'all probably know how to use PubMed a lot better than I do, to be honest with you. Um, but I just, I kind of learned this more recently um, when I'm actually looking for clinical questions. Like, obviously, if you're looking for a specific question, like what therapy to use in this setting, then you're going to look more specifically to that question. But if you're just trying to learn more about an illness, you just want to know what's out there, um, I always try to hit review and go, you have to take up the, jor the journal categories that's not um, already kind of selected as a category and go to core clinical journals. And I usually find that if I do those two things, and especially if I do it within a 10 year uh, period, I'll get to a reasonable number of articles to kind of look through to find, you know, something that looks like it's from a journal that I want to, to read about and learn more. And then um, here's just some more, res uh, the last bit of resources is you know, your medical textbooks, which we don't use as much as we used to, but they can be helpful for certain, certain situations. So with that, I, you know, that's kind of the conclusion of our talk today, but I hope that it's kind of helped you to, to kind of realize how you're thinking when you approach a patient, that you're trying to create this problem representation and you're, you're using illness scripts to kind of improve that problem representation as you're talking to the patient. Um, clinical prediction and risk stratification tools are your friends. Um, learn the ones that are useful, especially for things like MI, um, uh, PE, et cetera, and know, know when to apply them. And there's going to be different ones for different um, subspect or, you know, when you're on medicine versus when you're on surgery, et cetera. And then, just hope that we kind of talked about some to helpful tools you can use when you're learning and caring for patients. My last few pearls, and I, I'd say apply these more to internal medicine because that's where I'm. Uh, that's where I know the best. Um, but really, I think it, you can tell when someone's treating a patient as if they're their own. Really taking ownership of that patient's care, and I think that makes a huge difference. It pushes you to read more about the disease, and you learn and remember diseases a lot more. I mean, on my board exams now, I picture patients when a test question comes up. Like I just, I've seen it before with this, with Mrs. H, um, versus you know just uh, something I've read about. Ask for feedback and take advantage of it. Um, feedback is very helpful. When someone gives you honest feedback, it's one of the most helpful things that they can do for you. Um, and so uh, that's always helpful. And try to provide some honest feedback back as well. Um, and then take some, you know, as, as if you're given the opportunity, really take initiative. If you see your patient has anemia and no one's thought about it, take 20 minutes to read on anemia that day. and. It may just be that it's anemia of chronic disease, but you took some time to, to work it up. And I can tell you countless stories um, of students who have taken that opportunity and ran with it um, and really made a 
cool diagnosis that was missed um, by me or others on the team because they took that opportunity. Um, and so with that, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to come talk. Uh, if you have any questions, if you want to talk about this more, um, if you're just interested more about internal medicine and some of the features of it, just let me know.